right, continuing looking at the church as an organism, the body, the royal family, an organism. The next uh, point will be the church as an organization. But right now, the church as an organism. And we look, first of all, at the uh, Matthew 16, 18, where we read in the uh, in New International Version, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He's speaking to Peter, and he says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Well, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ begins this, and uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic. He says, I... He's the one who calls. He's the one who saves. He's the one who uh, perfects. He's the one who does it all. And then he says, I will build my church. Uh, the oikodomeo, a very, very important word. It, it, it's a future active indicative. Oikodomeo. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means to build. There's no question about it. It does mean to build. But the future indicative is very important. The future indicative not only refers to a future time, future to the time he was speaking here, but it also refers to a certainty. A certainty. Future time would be after the day, the day of Pentecost, and uh, then he would build... He would build that church for sure. There would be nothing to stop the building of that church. But the building implies a long, slow, drawn-out process, piece by piece, section by section. And the church has been, well, nearly 2,000 years in the building. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to continue to build. It may stop at any moment with the rapture of the church. But uh, it's a very important a thing that he's talking about. I will build my church. And remember, it's, it's his church. It will be his. It will always be his. Then he says this, the gates of hell. Uh, uh, Pule uh, refers to the councils of, uh, and then he says Hades. This refers to the unseen world. The, hate, the, the councils of the unseen is really the best way to translate that. They're going to oppose it they're going to do everything they can against it. Religion always has and always will persecute the church. But it will never succeed. Uh, you might want to check out a few verses uh, uh, as you are in Bible class. And I'm not going to stop and turn to them because I'd like to move on. But let me assign you uh, a few verses to look up and have uh, different persons read. You can stop the tape now and do it. 1 Corinthians 15.9 Galatians 1.13 Philippians 3.6 and 1 Thessalonians 2.15 But the counsels of darkness, the counsels of the unseen, will not prevail. Shall not overpower or shall not uh, destroy is uh, from Kat Iskuo. Looks like this. K. A-T-I-S-C-H-U-O. Kat is school. It means to prevail, to succeed, to accomplish one's desire, to be strong to another's detriment. And so we have a promise here. Uh, first of all, that God the Son will build his church, and he's doing it throughout this age. We also understand that the councils of, uh, the, of the unseen were going to oppose it. But we also understand this. They shall not overpower it. They shall not prevail. They shall not succeed. They shall not accomplish their purpose against a church. Way back, way back when, uh, when I was young, there used to be a song. Uh, it had to be you. It had to be you. And part of the song says, With all your faults, I love you still. It had to be you. Wonderful, you had to be you. Well, beloved, the church is filled with people who have faults. And nevertheless, regardless of the faults, the Lord loves us. 
he built his church and is building his church with not perfect people, but people who are the objects of his love, people who have placed their faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at a couple of other uh, occasions. Uh, in a couple of passages, the church is likened to a growing but yet incomplete structure. In 1 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, uh, the apostle says, For we, the referring to those who were planting, uh, we are God's uh, fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's build. The, we are a building, a building in process of being built. Ephesians uh, chapter 2, and reading in verses 21 and 22. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by means of his spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, another characteristic of the church as an organism, we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Both the word loved and gave uh, himself up. Both words are, the, are in the aorist tense uh, once and for all. He once and for all loved the church and once and for all gave himself up for it. Furthermore, it's like uh, a body. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verse 22. And he says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Beloved, remember that the head contains the brain. The head contains the mind. That's where the thinking is done. That's where the planning is done. Colossians 1 and verse 18 says, uh, well, uh, picking it up from verse 70, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that he might have the supremacy in absolutely everything. The rest of the body responds to what the mind is thinking. And if the mind is the head, and it is, and the mind is doing the thinking, how does the head or the mind uh, reveal itself to the rest of the body? Well, in the body of Christ, through the Word of God. And so the importance of studying the Word of God, giving yourself to the Word. The most important thing that any member of the body can do is to know what the mind is thinking. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us that what doctrine is the mind of Jesus Christ. And then Ephesians 5.24 uh, tells us that the church is to be subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should be submitting to their husbands in everything. The point simply being that the church uh, is arranged in rank under the authority of the, uh, the head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Furthermore, as, it, as, the, uh, as an organism, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29... Uh, or continuing the analogy between husbands and wives, but we find something about the church. The Lord Jesus Christ does two things. He says, after all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. Well, the, the, the first word, which is feeds, uh, is the word ek trephel. King James translates it nourishes. It means to nourish to maturity, to rear, to feed, to care for, as one's own body. This is the present active indicative form which tells us that he keeps on nourishing, he keeps on feeding the body. And secondly, cares for the body. The word is, is cherishes in the King James and it's the word thalpo, T-H-A-L-P-O in the Greek. 
It's the present active indicative, and it means to warm, to keep warm, thus to foster with tender care as a bird does its young. And it refers to protection and provision for the church. This is what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ does because he loves the church. He loves his body. He loves the royal family. He rears it. He feeds it. He cares for it. He warms it. He fosters it. He, he protects it. He provides for it. That's the kind of a savior we have. And then uh, we read in Ephesians 3.21 that the church as an organism receives glory by means of the church. To him be glory by means of the church uh, throughout all generations forever and ever. Uh, again, that uh, it might glorify him is also found in Ephesians 5.26 and 27. Uh, it's doctrine that makes the church set apart without blemish and it will produce the character of the Lord Jesus Christ inside the believer and that's the glory that is spoken of in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 we read his intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms in other words, to be, the word known is norizo, looks like this, G-N-O omega, R-I-Z-O omega, aorist passive subjunctive. The, uh, the angelic conflict, the angels are taught grace by means of the object lesson of the church. They receive this knowledge by means of the church. We are under angelic observation at all times, and God is saying to the angels, see, that, that's grace. That's grace. <laughs> we know that we are total products of the grace of God. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the apostle says, uh, well, beginning at 14, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how to uh, how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. That you may know is the present active subjunctive, meaning to see, to perceive, that you might perceive what is the right and proper way of conduct in the household or the royal family, uh, how the royal family of God is to behave on a strephole to conduct itself and he says this is the church the, the the church of the living God and then he says that the church is these people you and me members of the royal family we are pillars uh, stulos s-t-u-l-o-s speaks of our of authority and ground speaks of the stabilized support of the truth the church the body of Christ is the support of the truth Bible doctrine the Bible doctrine applied in our lives glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ by our conduct. And we therefore become a support of doctrine. Since the Word of God is the depository of doctrine, and, and we take the doctrine in, we become a support and a prop for that doctrine to the world in which we live. Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us that at the point of salvation, every believer becomes a member of the body, the church, the royal family, of God. And 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God tells us that God gave spiritual gifts to every member of the body of Christ and placed that person in the body according to his sovereignty and his choices according to the gifts that he has given. And finally, 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says that believers are not to be dissatisfied with the spiritual gift given by God, but to function under that gift. All right, now it's time, beloved, for us to turn to the church as an organization. The church as an organization. Dr. Richard Clearwater says uh, of the word ecclesia, the Greek word for church, our Lord and the New Testament writers neither coined this word nor used it in an unusual sense. Like any other word, according to the laws of language, it might be used abstractly, generically, particularly, 
or prospectively without losing its essential meaning. In its primary meaning, a church was an organized assembly whose members were properly called out from their private homes or businesses to attend to public affairs. In all of its usage, prescribed conditions of membership are implied, inferred, or expressed. Therefore, beloved, the church is a local assembly of believers. Now, we must correct a misunderstanding uh, as to how many people it takes to make up a church. <laughs> and the thing that is constantly uh, used, unfortunately, as the, um, the proof text is uh, a, a, a passage that really is taken completely out of context. The context that I'm talking about is found in Matthew 18, verse 20, where it says, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. That is not the church. The context, and that's been taken totally out of context, the context is found beginning in verse 15 with a brother who sins against you. And let me read it and show you the context. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your, your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's Deuteronomy uh, 19.15. So it's law, it's legalism. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or as a tax collector. So here is how to handle church problems. How do you handle church problems? I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you sh loose on earth shall have been bound uh, in heaven. Uh, the, po the, the, the context, uh, the, 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 the uh, tense of the verb makes that clear. But let's go on. Verse 19, again I tell you, that if two of you shall agree on anything uh, you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Verse 19 has nothing to do with prayer either. The point has to do with the how, how does the church solve the problem? Well, the church solves this problem, I'll tell you how. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but uh, the point is this. Two or three gather together in his name, and uh, they ask for the wisdom, and they make the determination, and that's the determination for uh, the brother who has sinned against the other brother. Anytime a believer listens to doctrine, that is a church. Believe it or not. Now, there is the, there, uh, there is the, that is the, uh, the church, the body of Christ. For the body of Christ... The, the church universal is anywhere a believer is. And a believer may be somewhere in the darkest parts of Africa, somewhere in the, the, up in Siberia, on a desert island, and he studies doctrine. He is a church. But there is such a thing as a local church. A local church consists of believers in a given geographical area who assemble themselves together for the purpose of studying the Word of God. The building has no bearing on the meaning of church. It was often in the early church in the house, in their house. In fact, when uh, Paul writes to Timothy and tells uh, women to stop going uh, as busybodies from house to house, he's referring from church to church because that's where the church met. The church didn't meet in buildings, occasionally there was a, they met in a school, but uh, they, they didn't meet in buildings. They met in outdoors. They met in upper rooms, hall, which was a hall. They met in all kinds of places. The building is not the church. It houses the church sometimes, but any kind of a building may house the church. <laughs> well, I, uh, when I, we first uh, were, came before to uh, Sarasota, I noticed 
uh, a church that was meeting in a funeral home. Now, I'm, that's not my kind of meeting place. Uh, I don't uh, uh, care <laughs> to, to do that. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, they were concerned, they met there for a brief period of time. Uh, so, but you meet where you can meet. You meet where it's possible to meet. The building is, by the way, by the, the building is never a sanctuary. The sanctuary was destroyed in 70 A.D., which was the temple, and every believer is a sanctuary himself, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. The building is not the house of God. Now, you might stretch it by saying um, the house belonging to God, but uh, that's also true of my house and yours. Uh, it's, uh, it's God's house, it's God's car, it's, it's God's clothes, everything belongs to the Lord. And it is never, however, the house where God dwells, for God does not dwell in temples made with hands, Acts 7:48. Now, uh, this does have a great deal of meaning uh, when it comes to teaching children about the building. I recall uh, being in a church uh, and I was speaking to the primary department and uh, that day, so I went upstairs and was waiting while the children were gathering and they were uh, rather uh, loud and riotous and the teacher came in and uh, she was uh, totally, completely aghast. She said, oh, children, she said, be quiet or you'll scare away the Holy Ghost. Well, for goodness sake, I like to upchuck at that very thought. But I was later on discreetly able to correct her mis, uh, misteaching to the boys and girls. But they many, uh, many times they will say, now boys and girls, be very careful. In the ho This is the house of God. Well, children must be taught that there's nothing sacred or holy about the building that houses the church. However, they must not have contempt for it either. That is, they should respect the, the building or any place, wherever it is. They should respect other people's uh, 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 property. They should respect other people's homes. This should be taught to every child. Uh, it has nothing to do with spirituality or holiness. Children should be taught not to play the organ or the piano, uh, not be, unless they know how to do it and ask permission because it isn't their property. But it is the place for study of the Word of God and for koinonia fellowship together with believers. And for that we turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. A very important word. And, uh, and, and with this we're going to have uh, the, the opportunity to make uh, some uh, uh, comments in just a few moments. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25, uh, the apostle is getting, uh, whoever wrote it, the author of Hebrews, is getting ready to uh, point out, uh, I should say 10.25, I'm, I, I looked at it wrong, I know, what I'm, I know the verse, but when I'm saying 10.25, he's getting ready to uh, warn them uh, about uh, entering into spiritual decline uh, and uh, he, he sets it up by saying in verse 23 he, Hebrews 10 23 let us hold unswervingly to the confidence we uh, not profess but uh, uh, to, to let us hold fast to the uh, acknowledgement of the confidence without ye uh, the acknowledgement of our confidence without yielding for faithful is the one who has promised and let us be considerate of one another to incite to love and good works not forsaking the coming together of ourselves as the custom of some is but exhorting uh, actually encouraging and by so much more as you see drawing near the day. That's the literal translation from the Greek. Forsaking is a compound word and it's egg kata lipo. It comes from three uh, different words. Uh, egg is really n and it refers to some place or circumstance. Kata is the preposition of Norman Standard but it also means down with the idea of rejecting defeat or helplessness and lipo means to leave with the idea of forsaking. And so uh, the word in its totality means to abandon, to desert, to leave helpless, to, be, to leave destitute, or to let one down. It is used of Demas leaving Paul in 2 Timothy 4.10. It is used of, uh, in the uh, contrary way, 
uh, in which the Lord uh, it says the Lord will know not ever uh, abandon, desert, leave helpless, destitute, or let us down. Now it is a, the it is the present tense plus the negative. And when you have the present tense plus the negative, it should be really stop doing something that you are uh, doing. And what is it that he's telling them to do? Stop uh, 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 forsaking. Stop uh, rejecting the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, there were some who were withdrawing from the fellowship of the believers in the city of Jerusalem and they were going back to the uh, worship, uh, uh, the uh, Hebrew Jewish worship in the temple. They were, they were uh, turning their backs. Hebrews chapter 6 uh, uh, tells us uh, uh, about their, their uh, apostasy, really. And the, the beginning in verse 26 of the, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, if we deliberate, keep on, deliberately keep on sinning, we're doing the very same thing. We're withdrawing. And they were doing this. Some, some were doing it to withdraw, to go back to, to, to the temple and, and uh, involved. And this was sinning. To go back to legalism after having been in grace is sinning. And so okay, keep, the, keep the context in mind here. Because there are some people who are going to tell you that uh, even if the church is legalistic, so long as it teaches something about grace, so long as it's fundamental, you should be there. Wrong! You shouldn't! You're not to go back to, to the Old Testament weak and beggarly elements. You're not to go back to, to bondage and legalism. You're not to submit for the sake of fellowship, for the sake of, well, think of the encouragement you're going to be to somebody else. Hogwash, balderdash, and falderall. It has nothing to do with that. We are to encourage one another. Right. The, the previous verse said that. We are to be a blessing to one another. Right. But we're not to compromise doctrine in order to be a blessing or to be an encouragement or to, to pat somebody else on the head. Doctrinal purity, truth, is more important than anything else. Uh, it's so hard uh, to, to, to uh, get people to understand uh, things like this sometimes. I don't uh, quite uh, uh, comprehend how folks can do it. Uh, let me, uh, I would like, if you will bear with me, uh, let me read you something that I think is rather important. Uh, uh, Professor Richard Mayhew uh, uh, wrote in, uh, uh, the, in the Spire, the magazine of Grace Theological Seminary, uh, um, some, some years ago, uh, and I have uh, this in my file, and I think it's very important. Uh, and let me just give you some points here. Uh, I'll skip some of it, but and uh, let me read it to you. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Biblical revelation verifies that it was the chicken. Which comes first, love or truth? According to Second John chapter six, uh, Second John verse six, it is truth. Note the uh, the nature of the statement. Quote: This is Second John six, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. The chronological sequence unfolds like this. His commandments, that's truth. Acting on his truth, obedience. The result of acting on his uh, truth, love. Now, love and truth are inseparable. You can, however, have truth without love if truth is not acted on. But you can never have biblical love without biblical truth as love's basis. Concerning the ecclesiastical separation, the practice of truth in love is not easy, nor is it pleasant. God's people have struggled with it from the opening days of creation when Eve chose to dialogue and experiment with a liar who opposed God's truth. Most will admit that it's easier to know truth than it is to practice truth. George Eldon Ladd in Eternity Magazine of June 1962 says, quote, Let's face it, if the New Testament is our only infallible rule of faith and practice, and if the New Testament teaches that absolute doctrinal purity is an essential mark of the church, and if it commands us to withdraw whenever doctrinal impurity is found, then the separatist position is justified. A greater priority than the unity of the church, 
demands a fracturing of that unity. Grace has a, a statement that uh, has a, in their theological statement which uh, which uh, uh, demands a separation in the ecclesiastical realm from uh, those who are uh, apostate. And he goes on to say, this traditional statement fully acknowledged that biblical revelation is our only source of information in matters of faith and practice. This does not, however, limit the Bible's authority to these areas. The Bible alone provides us with the authoritative information about God, origins, salvation, human destiny, the proper conduct for human life, but it also provides us with the only authoritative framework for the interpretation of all other data. One cannot escape the biblical conclusion that Jesus Christ and the apostles believed and taught that doctrine is important to know and to practice in its entirety. When our Lord Jesus Christ sent people out in the Great Commission, he uh, uh, sent them out and he said, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. The post-Pentecost church focused on the apostles' teaching, Acts 2.42, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. The angel commanded the apostles in Acts 5.20, saying, Go your way, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Paul evaluated his preaching and teaching ministry as complete and thorough, Acts 20.27, 20, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. The epistles are filled with clear and direct biblical statements which demand ecclesiastical separation. And uh, these will be dealt with in the doctrine of separation, uh, which will be uh, the taught in relationship to uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 30, 29, 30, and 31. Uh, to, but some of them are Romans 16, verses 17 to 20. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 13. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Galatians 1, 8. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. And uh, uh, Titus 3, 10 and 11. His conclusion then. We should not be surprised when God's word demands separation from circumstances which pose a direct threat to the health and vitality of the flock. Doctrinal error is a disease. Doc, Dr. Ladd was, perspective, pardon me, was perceptive in noting the three necessary biblical conditions which would warrant the placing of doctrinal purity higher in priority than church unity. One, the Bible is our only infallible rule of faith and practice. Two, doctrinal purity is an essential mark of the church. Three, the New Testament does command separation from doctrinal impurity. Because these conditions are fulfilled by New Testament teaching, it is concluded with confidence that the Bible expressly forbids ecclesiastical relationships with those who reject truth and persist in doctrinal errors. And uh, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, beloved. A quote from Dr. Richard Mayhew from Grace Theological Seminary. The, the, the forsaking uh, of uh, the assembling of oneself together, it doesn't mean that you are uh, abandoning. No, you, uh, uh, if, you, if you leave a church because of doctrinal impurity. This is referring to a person who because of... of uh, uh, sin in the life of some sort. Uh, you, you make it, uh, by application, take it across the board. Uh, it may not be going back to the legalism. But whatever it is, uh, sin in the life causes the person to forsake the assembling of oneself together. The word assembling is epi sun agoge. And uh, again, we have the compound. Epi means full, sun is together, and agoge is a leading. So if it means uh, the gathering together for the purpose of learning, educationing, uh, uh, being led, trained, educated, or taught. And so, uh, uh, the command is uh, to stop the uh, rejection of uh, the uh, assembling together 
as the manner of some is, especially as the day approaches. Well, the point uh, uh, is that uh, there are times when it is absolutely necessary to leave a given church, but you must never uh, leave the church in that you stop studying Bible doctrine. So that uh, usually, and, and I have suggested this to some people, because I don't want anyone to think that I believe I'm the only one who's teaching the truth. That is not true. I know that that is not the case. And so, like when David and Stephanie moved uh, to Savannah, Georgia, I suggested to them that they check out some of the churches. Now, what churches? Well, uh, generally speaking, check out some of the Bible churches. But watch out for the charismatic. They call themselves that sometimes. Watch out for Bible church. But check out the Bible churches. Many, the, many times the independent fundamental Bible church will be very good teaching. However, sometimes they're very, very legalistic, extremely legalistic. Some of the Baptist churches, Southern Baptist churches, generally emphasize evangelism to the exclusion of teaching, and you don't want to spend much time associating with them. But uh, there are other Baptist churches which are very legalistic, and some uh, do teach the truth. You do want to stay away from the Presbyterian, the Reformed, that whole group, because that group is covenant theology. Uh, so it's not easy, but I suggest it. visit some churches and use the doctrine that you have to make comparisons. Later on, uh, uh, we were sitting in our home, and, and David uh, gave, said, that, I wish you had uh, told us about the churches before. We wouldn't have wasted so much time uh, going there and finding that, that they're worthless. Well, they're, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said, something like that. And the point anyway is, and, and I wanted David to understand that the reason I did that is I didn't want him to think I was the only one who's teaching doctrine, the only one who's teaching truth. I don't believe that. There are many, many men uh, who are teaching truth around the country, around the world. Uh, and, I, and I was uh, fearful that if I said, study tapes and forget about the local church, that uh, he would get, uh, they would get the wrong impression. I'm not saying forget about the local church. If there is a local church where there, the teaching of the truth is pure, unadulterated, and grace is exalted, and there's no uh, legalism uh, and distortion of, of false teaching, be a part of that local assembly. Uh, take in the word face to face, okay, as long as that uh, pastor is your right pastor. You determine that, remember, that the right pastor, and there are a lot of people who will, uh, who will uh, a lot of pastors who will teach the word of God uh, in, in a manner which we call exegetically. That is, they will uh, take it apart, even you sometimes refer to the original languages. That's not the criterion. The criterion is this. Do they teach exegetically and categorically? Are they teaching systematic theology? You remember my old saying, I've said it a thousand times, uh, any pastor can tell you what time it is. That's preaching a sermon. But your right pastor teaches you how to build a clock. That is, he teaches you how to become self-sustaining in your own soul so that you can face the exigencies of life. And that for that you must have categorical doctrines, line upon line, precept upon precept. The line upon line is the exegesis, precept upon precept is the categories of doctrine. And so the assembling of yourselves together is important okay, when it's possible. But, beloved, it isn't always possible. Take Second John, for example. Uh, they had no pastor. What happened? John the Apostle wrote them a letter. He didn't have a tape recorder. He didn't have a video uh, cassette he could send. And so he wrote them a letter. And that was his way of teaching to that church. And the, the, uh, it was necessary in the early church to do that because pastors were not easy to come by. Now today there are a large number of uh, pastors available, I understand who are uh, uh, without churches because uh, uh, there is a vast amount of apostasy in our land. And they, these men who are prepared, adequately prepared, who know the original languages, are able to exegete scripture, and who believe in categorical teaching, uh, uh, systematic theology, uh, are not being heard because this generation does not want it. Now, uh, when we began here in Sarasota, we had no uh, promise of anything. We came down and uh, if there was nobody, so I talk every week to Jan and Jan alone. And I say this, to any man who, desire, who desires to be a pastor teacher, if you can't teach your family, forget teaching. Just don't do it. 
You, can you suppose so, but nobody comes to my Bible class? I teach Jan anyway. That's what you're supposed to do. You teach whether somebody's there or not. Now, if there's nobody there, of course, you don't teach. But if there's, if there's one person there and that person is your wife, she's as important as anybody else. And if somebody can't make it to Bible class, that's too bad. They can pick it up on tape if they want to or catch up some other way. You teach your wife. You teach your children. You teach your family. You're not, just like a boat trip never made a missionary, a, a, a group of people never made a pastor. The pastor is made by the gifts that God has given to him and because he has something to teach. And if the people aren't there, that's their problem. That's up to them. That's their free will and volition. But we began, and I taught Jan beginning in June all the way through December at our open house uh, that we had at Christmas time. A family came along, and we were talking, and we told them we had our Bible class on Tuesday nights because I work on Sunday morning. And so they began coming in January of that year. Now, they've been coming now for uh, the, uh, the, the, all of last year they came. And uh, they came the year before. They said, we're now here. We'll be here three years in April. And they've been coming. Well, last um, uh, fall, last uh, fall, another family heard my announcement. I do put the announcement on uh, the community calendar on the Christian station that I work for and occasionally put a little notice in the uh, religious page of the n local newspaper. Just because I'm not trying to hide and you have to make things known. Well, anyway, this family came. Uh, and uh, they uh, began to, uh, they were, seemed extremely positive. One week they, uh, they actually came in late because uh, he had gotten off the plane in Tampa and they had driven from Tampa directly to Bible class so they could be there. So it looked as if they were very, very positive. However, God, a okay, man looks in the outward appearance, and, but God ponders the heart. Well, along the way, uh, uh, I, we, we were too big now, with the, and then when John moved down, we were too large to meet here in my home, uh, so we, uh, we asked if we could use the uh, Youth for Christ uh, uh, office, and we met there for the month of December. And uh, one there, uh, I don't know if it was what I taught, but I mentioned about RB theme, and one of the families said, who is RB theme? This new family said, who's RB theme? And the other family decided that, well, it would be good, and they took about 25 books about our, by RB theme and gave them to this new family. Well. Uh, uh, the next week, they, this family didn't come, and the following week I found those books on my front uh, doorstep, and they have not returned. Okay, I'm not sure if it was something I taught, or something that they were offended from the, the, uh, Colonel Thiem's books. It doesn't make a bit of difference why they didn't come. They made a volitional decision not to come to this Bible class. Though they, uh, they really loved it, they seemed that they were very, very positive, that's what I thought. But, in fact, I was thinking, well, maybe this is the beginning because they were talking about bringing all their friends and so forth and so on. And <laughs> no, uh, nothing has materialized. So after the end of December, we couldn't afford to pay. Uh, well, they did, Youth for Christ did not set any fee figure. They just uh, kind of left it uh, uh, entirely a uh, donation. And so uh, once I had paid uh, uh, $50 for the month of December, I decided there's no sense in putting $50 out. But we could meet back in our home. Uh, and uh, send any uh, extra monies that we have to Moody's Sermons for Science for their Atlanta thing, and to, to uh, we want to send something to Ralph LaRosa, uh, but uh, that money which I was going to send them now went for rent for December. So we moved back to my home. Like, what's the difference? Uh, as I say in the newsletter, uh, back to square one. That's exactly where we are. What's the difference? Uh, the number of bodies in any given puke doesn't make for any church organization. Uh, we have a simple... Uh, a group of people who meet together to study the Word of God, and that is Grace Memorial Bible Church of Florida's Sun Coast. That's what we are. In fact, uh, we just were able to get a, uh, an employer identification number from the uh, IRS so that we can now open uh, a bank account in the church's name uh, at the credit union instead of uh, uh, having to, to keep separate account in my own account because uh, uh, the church, uh, uh, the banks will not give us a, 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 a church account unless uh, we are incorporated and uh, we can't afford incorporation. It's a couple hundred dollars uh, for that. Anyway, the point is that uh, we are a church even though we do not have uh, much more than a pastor and no organization, which is what we're talking about. 
Dr. Chafer says uh, about the church and her organization, organization is wisdom's first step for a people associated together in a common cause. But organization is for a purpose, and therefore it is not a purpose itself. Well, uh, 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 let me uh, uh, read something else to you. Uh, Chester A. McCauley uh, is the pastor of Word of Truth uh, Church in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and a very fine exegete of scripture, formerly a teacher at uh, Columbia Bible College and a couple of other places. But uh, uh, he has uh, uh, done some work on uh, church organization. And I'd like to read for you uh, something he says on uh, or observations on church organization. And I'm going to get into a couple of passages of Scripture with you. Observations on church organization. One, the virtues of uh, the pastor should be true of all believers with the exception of two. That is, all believers are not required to be skillful teachers, and all believers can't avoid being new converts. But uh, the passage of Scripture in uh, 1 Timothy uh, begins speaking of deacons as to their qualifications, but does not tell us what their duty is other than to serve. This is the case because their modes of service will vary. The duty of the pastor does not. Wherever he serves, he is to superintend and to teach. This is unchanged by time and place. Number two, and this is really radical, sit on the edge of your chair and listen to this. In no place do we find either pastors or deacons formed into what we know as a board or committee. Whether in the nation or in the church, there are always great leaders, but there are never great committees. No one can see a committee finding a place in the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, the church has structured itself after corporate America. Macaulay goes on to say that the key issue in the church is not its organization, but its mission. It is the power of the Word of God and not the power of a board that makes the church effective. It's not compounded wisdom of many, but the simple adherence to the Word of God that is needed. He, he adds, uh, uh, fourthly, a major feature of the New Testament church organization was simplicity, not complexity. And then, six, the fundamental principle of church organization is this, organize only as ministries rise that need organizations. Six, operation of the local church by democratic rule is a fatal assumption. The majority of the church is spiritually um, uh, uh, mature. Rule by majority is inevitably rule by carnality because the majority of the church is not spiritually mature. In most cases, if not all cases. So democratic rule is wrong. And seven, uh, as, as can be seen in all the passages dealing with deacons, deacons have no ruling authority at all. The very word means servant, and servants take orders. They do not give them. The greatest service that a deacon can render is to help create the kind of atmosphere in the church that will be conducive to edification through teaching of the Word of God. He should be ever alert to that which he can do to enhance and preserve this priority. Only when he has done this can say he say that he has truly served. So, uh, as far as uh, the church organization is concerned, it, 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 it will be according to particular needs, and therefore it's going to vary from one church to another. Uh, and that, that organization will be uh, uh, done biblically. Well, now let's, uh, let's notice uh, uh, what, uh, a couple of passages of Scripture I want to turn, first of all, to Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. For this gives us the uh, typical church of that day. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. And this is what it says. And you'll notice, please, three uh, groups that are uh, here as part of this church. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Now there are the, the, the believers in the church, the congregation, together with the overseers and the deacons. The overseers is the word episkopos, which refers to the pastor, uh, and the deacons. 
Now, uh, all believers are equal before the Lord. There are no distinctions to be made. Uh, there is no one any better than another. However, there may be some people who are given specific areas of responsibility in a local church for the purpose of uh, uh, meeting specific needs, as Macaulay has said. Um, uh, the illustration uh, is found in Acts chapter 6. Uh, remember that the need arose. What was the need? Well, uh, the widows. Uh, there was a problem with the feeding of the widows. Uh, and uh, what was happening was that because of the uh, Hebrew ethnicity there, uh, the, uh, the Hebrews were feeding the Hebrews. Uh, the widows of the uh, Greeks were being overlooked. Um, uh, the, 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 Grecians, the Greek speaking Jews uh, were being overlooked by the Hebrew speaking Jews. They were being snubbed in the daily distribu di distribution of food. And as, since that was the case, as soon as they realized what the problem was, uh, uh, the, uh, there was a necessary organization. Well, uh, in, in verse uh, 2, the twelve uh, disciples said, It is not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Because that's exactly right. Uh, having done this, they then recommended seven men who have spiritual qualifications and these men were what? They were to feed they were to feed the widows of, the, of all the widows to make sure that there was no, none neglected. That was the need and the need was then met. However, beloved, when the need is no longer there then there's no need for an organization to meet that need. Now, let me prove it to you. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul is giving some instruction to Timothy regarding the, uh, uh, the, the operation of the local church. And he says something interestingly, uh, very interesting, in 1 Timothy 5, 9. And this is what he says. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, and so forth and so on. What is it saying there? Well... Uh, the church had a widow list. Apparently they didn't have deacons at that time, but they had a widow list. A list of widows uh, that would uh, uh, receive uh, ministry to. Now, uh, how many churches have a widow list today? Why not? Because once the need is met, the organization to meet it is no longer needed. And if you don't have widows, you don't need a widow's list, don't you see? Apparently, for some reason, there were many widows in the early church that, to whom Paul was writing. And so you have this unusual circumstance and situation. So you only have as much organization as there is individual need for that organization, beloved. And so uh, we, we recognize that the Philippian church had believers uh, who were a part of that local church. They had the episcopos, the presbuteros, the poimenos didaskalos, uh, uh, three different references to the pastor teacher, the head of the local assembly. He is the authority in that local church. And that authority is only with reference to the local church, its operation, and spiritual authority. Now, this does not mean that the pastor ever has a right to tell people in his congregation, how to live their lives, what to do uh, with anything. That is entirely between them and the Lord. But the pastor teacher sets up the policy for the local church. He's the presbuteros, the old man. He sets the policy. He is the episcopos. He, he is the overseer. He's the one who well, sees over to sees that things run right. He is the poimenos. He is the shepherd uh, of the flock. He is the didaskalos. He's the teacher. These are his functions. And so he sets up the policies. And there are times when the pastor must uh, enforce the policy as the overseer that he has set up as the presbuteros. 
and it's uh, uh, sometimes it has to hurt people. Uh, uh, if I find, uh, uh, and I have in my congregation, I was used to find people, uh, uh, teenagers would sit back and, and talk to each other during the, the, the sermon. I cut that off because they have no, the Word of God is the mind of Jesus Christ and nobody, what, what, what anybody else has to say is not important enough to disturb the Word of God and to be a distraction to serious students of the Word of God who have gathered there in that congregation. They have a right to hear the Word of God taught and not be distracted by some jackasses who sit back there and talk during the sermon. And so there is a strict policy in my congregation. Always. No talking. And have the children go to the restroom before church, not during church. Because it's a distraction to have someone get up out of the congregation, take the little beast by the hand, and lead them to the restroom, and then five or ten minutes later to come walking back, crawl across all the people, and sit down. It's, it's a distraction from what you're there for. The Word of God is alive and powerful. How dare you have the arrogance to take away from the Word of God? Now, these were just some of the policies. By policy, you could dress any way you want and come to our church. Why? Because it's grace. If you're on positive volition, other policy, you can come late, just don't leave early. <laughs> that was uh, the policy. I never bought, I mean, people would say, I'm sorry to come, if you, come, if you have to come late, fine, come, just so you're there, get what you can. But those were policies that I set. And I had uh, a, a, a deacon who was an usher. He was, he was in charge of the ushering. His job was to see that that was carried out. Uh, that my orders were carried out. But anyway, the point is, some organization may be necessary from time to time, and only as it is needed. Before closing today, um, uh, let me uh, talk about the response of the...